Hi everyone, this is Lindsay Glasner here. I'm going to be your presenter tonight. Uh, Ingrid, can you hear me? I just want to make sure that everybody's audio is working. Kelly gave me the thumbs up and usually if she can hear me then everybody else can. Oh good, wonderful. Well I just wanted to start on this uh, quick image here of what do students do when teachers say they need two weeks to do the inquiry project. I personally enjoy the what inquiry project. How many of you have experienced that as educators? That's always a fun one. So thank you tonight for joining us with the Supporting Student Investigations webinar. Uh, again, my name is Lindsay Glasner. I'm the Bird Sleuth Outreach Coordinator, and I'm joined tonight with Kelly Schaefer, our Education Specialist. And we'll provide and discuss how to support student investigations. Now we're going to be using the Zoom platform, and just so you become familiar with it in case this is new to you, uh, you'll probably be in full screen when I first started sharing my page. I do recommend escaping that and then opening up the chat window and having that chat window on the side. We will try and um, have this be an interactive webinar. When you are utilizing the chat window, please make sure you send to everyone, um, not just to the panelists, but we want your conversations and your feedback and your ideas to be shared with the group. That's how we'll be able to better engage as an educational community. So before we begin, let's test out that chat window. And if you can, please introduce yourself, uh, what type of educator you are and where you're signing in from. Yes, thank you. We are live in Ithaca right now. South Carolina, Houston, some, a lot of informal educators, some kindergarten teachers, homeschool in Canada, India, wonderful. Well, I'm glad this is an international webinar. California, Syracuse, you're not too far away from us, Kristen. Kirsten? Oh, Kirsten, yes, I can actually read. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for coming out tonight for this late webinar. Um, as Kelly knows, I joke about it every single time. An 8 p.m. webinar is past my bedtime, so <laughs> I'm, you're keeping me up, but I'm really excited about tonight's topic. There we go. So specifically, Kelly and I are in Ithaca, New York. We are with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and sitting somewhere in this beautiful building, though currently it's covered in snow. Mm -hmm. And our mission at the Lab of Ornithology is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. And specifically, Kelly and I are with the Bird Sleuth K-12 team here at the lab. So we take all the knowledge and research that's happening here to create innovative resources and trainings that build science skills while they inspire young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. So I'll be talking throughout the webinar tonight, but if you have any questions at all, um, do send them in the chat window. Kelly will be monitoring the chat window, as well as sharing helpful links throughout this webinar. So today's webinar, we plan to cover a few different topics. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so there's no need to stress with taking any notes. First, we'll discuss and review what inquiry is and how you can foster inquiry through experiments and investigations. We'll talk about common mistakes youth make with data interpretation and visualization. And then we'll finish off by exploring opportunities for your students to share the results of their investigations, just like the real scientists that they are. Now, this webinar is going to be based off of two resources that we provide. One is a free curriculum and the other one is a uh, paid online course. The first is investigating evidence on the left. This is a free curriculum to foster inquiry and in investigations, both inside the classroom and out. And the best part about this curriculum, though it's free, it's a completely comprehensive and standards aligned curriculum. And it's not focused on birds, but instead focused on the process and concepts of what inquiry is and how to foster inquiry in your educational setting. 
Now to complement investigating evidence is our online course, Integrated Inquiry for Educators. This is a paid course. Um, the base rate is $49, but what it does provide you is practice and the professional development needed to develop your inquiry skills as an educator, both through online tutorials, interactive quizzes, classroom case studies, and supplemental readings. This is really focused on getting you uh, comfortable with your professional skills in fostering the inquiry in your educational setting. So Kelly shared the link to those two resources. Um, I do highly recommend you look through the investigating evidence curriculum. And if you feel you do want more support around inquiry and um, the pedagogy of inquiry, I do recommend looking into our course. Now let's have a quick review of inquiry. This webinar is a standalone webinar in our free series, but I do recommend that if at all you become confused or need further details around the concept of inquiry, stimulating observations, um, maybe taking questions students are naturally asking and rewording those questions so they design experimental studies. We actually had a webinar this past fall called An Introduction to Inquiry, where we reviewed those three main topics of what is inquiry, how to foster observations, and how to take those observations and translate those into uh, experimental questions to lead to investigations. So this webinar, An Introduction to Inquiry, as with all of our monthly webinar series, are recorded and archived on our YouTube channel, Bert Sleuth. And so Kelly has shared the link with that in the chat window. Um, so if you do feel that you want a refresher or want to be interested in any of our other inquiry webinars, I do recommend looking at the YouTube channel. So let's make sure we all are on the same basis when I keep mentioning this word inquiry. Now in the chat window, if you could uh, provide me any kind of definitions or keywords that you think of when you hear the word inquiry. And again, make sure that your responses uh, in the chat window are selected to everyone. Investigating a question, asking about something. Students' questions based on observations. An investigation linked to students' wonders. Asking, I wonder, and then following up with an experiment or investigation. Learning through asking your own questions. Absolutely. I agree with all of you. It's always based on their interests and wonders. That's a really big point, Jennifer. Yeah, I highly agree with all of you. It's something when we think of inquiry in, in birth sleuth, you know, or in any kind of educational setting, there are so many different responses that can come up. I know when I was in school and I was taught inquiry, or back then the scientific method, it was this linear process, a step-by-step -step where you're literally checking off the boxes. First you ask a question, then you do the background research, you conduct a hypothesis, you test the hypothesis, you analyze the data, and then you report it. That's it, it's that straight linear model. Um, other people, when you think of inquiry, they formulate that feedback loop. So it's still linear, but any kind of reflection will always lead back towards asking a new question. We're getting there, but uh, we really don't want to formalize inquiry necessarily with a formal definition of an act of asking for information or an official investigation. Instead, when Birdsley thinks of inquiry, we really think of it in three parts. And you guys touched on many of those parts in that discussion. First and foremost, inquiry is all about students asking and answering their own questions. And these questions are a way to understand our world. Questioning is central to learning and growing. Teachers and educators often comment that taking kids outside for observations is a great way to motivate students to start those question uh, developments in science. And those observations are the foundations for inquiry. And from those observations, that's where we naturally draw on the authentic scientific learning. And I love that you brought in, Jennifer, that it's all about the student's interest because those observations are going to touch on what their interests are. 
And you want to ensure that the students are motivated uh, around the topics and the questions that they're asking, because that will invest in that inquiry process. The next big component of inquiry that we like to think of is to allow project-based learning. Once students start to make observations, questions will naturally arise. And encouraging those questions is key because we want to emphasize that questions are good, especially if you as the educator don't know the answer to those questions. That challenges the students that, hey, well, they don't know the answer. Let's find out the answer together. Or maybe this is something that nobody knows. I could be the one to discover it. And it's okay for you as an educator to say, I don't know, Jenny, how can we figure out this question? What would we do to figure this out? And going through that project-based learning model, again, that authenticity aspect. And finally, the ultimate process uh, with inquiry is the fact that it's inherently meeting the next generation science standards. And that's where we're having students observe, ask, investigate. And they're um, asking their own questions, planning and carrying out investigations, analyzing and interpreting data, using that computational thinking and so on. They're inherently following the, the necessary models of inquiry and science, which are meeting many science standards. So when you combine these three components, we're not looking at inquiry as a linear scientific method, but instead it's a science process that's completely complex. It's something where we want to focus on this idea that yes, oftentimes investigations may start off with those observations we first make, but they could be starting off by reading background material or just starting off with a basic experiment and going from there. But ultimately, it's not linear or just one feedback loop. The science process can start and end in many of these different locations. So today we're really gonna focus on this concept of how to design a FAIR experiment, how to collect and analyze that data, and then focusing on sharing those results and bringing that full circle of the science process by having your students become published scientists. In our last webinar, we discussed a lot about how observations from an open inquiry can lead to a variety of questions. And these questions are the basis for student investigations. But specifically, we're gonna focus on these experimental studies. So, with any observations, you may have students um, read and then draw conclusions directly from reference materials. You may have them analyze and explore data. You may have them conduct observational studies, but again, we're gonna focus on these experimental studies. And with experiments, it's really important to recognize that this requires students to identify an independent variable and that's a variable that's going to be changed by the person doing the experiment, as well as a dependent variable. And the de dependent variable is the variable that's going to be measured. The dependent variable is dependent on the independent variable. So the answer, or should I say, when we're looking at the experiments, we wanna make sure that we're only changing one variable and everything else that we aren't changing, we wanna make sure they're maintaining um, as a constant or control in an experiment. And that's what really makes an experimental study is the independent and dependent variable. So with experimental studies, and why is it important to only change the independent variable? What might happen if we change more than the independent variable? So in the chat one, I wanna explore this question. Why should we only change the independent variable in an experiment? Absolutely. If you change more than one variable, it's hard to know which variable is influencing your results. It makes the observation uh, confusing and conclusive. Too many variables change. It's difficult to determine the relationship between the variables. 
That's absolutely right. We want to focus on this relationship between the independent and the dependent variable. So by not having controls, we then it affects our conclusion. It affects our interests or sorry, it affects our understanding of how those two variables are related to each other. So when we focus on this idea of keeping constants and only changing the independent variable, that's when we talk about uh, an experiment that's being fair. Having a, a fair experiment is important. That's when everything except the independent independent variable is held constant. So that's what we want to make sure having that fair experiment will allow us to state that um, chickadees will only come out at sunrise. I'm trying to come up on top of my head with that, and that was very difficult. But um, we want to make sure that our independent variable is the only variable that's changing to determine that we do have a fair experiment. So instead of coming up with a random experiment off the top of my head, fortunately I have a planned example. And let's go through this planned example and identify our different variables. So these are the fledgling ornithologists. And they're asking the question, will birds prefer blue, red, or yellow bird feeder? So when looking at this, uh, it's often really valuable for young and old students to identify with their question, well, what is our constants, what are the constants we need to maintain, what is our independent variable, and what is our dependent variable. So with these fledgling ornithologists, let's identify that for them. In the chat window, can you identify uh, constants? What are some constants that we need to be aware of, or controls that we need to be aware of? The type of food, the location of the bird feeder. Using the same food, the placement of the feeder, yes. The season, the location. Absolutely. So when we're looking at constants, time of day, weather, location of the bird feeder, the type of seed being used, these are all constants or controls that we need to be aware of. So if we're going to test this, will birds prefer a blue, red, a blue feeder or red feeder or a yellow feeder, we don't necessarily want to design the experiment so that one week we only have the blue feeder out, the next week we only have the red feeder out, and the, and the third week we only have a yellow feeder out. Because every single feeder may be subject to changes in season. Instead, uh, in the observation availability too, actually, that's a great way um, to make sure it's constant. We also don't want to necessarily have all feeders out at the same time, but have the yellow feeder a foot from the ground, the blue feeder 20 feet in the air, and the red feeder at 12 feet in the air. Again, the different locations of the bird feeder will also influence the results. So location of the feeder, the kind of seed, the type of feeder, and person, like you said, the observation availability. You don't want to observe one feeder in the morning and one feeder in, at the evening. That's where you're not going to have a fair experiment. So what about the independent variable? What would be the independent variable for this experiment? Wind is also a good uh, control to try and think of, Jaya. Okay, for independent variable, yes, the color of the feeders, that's exactly right. So. The color of the bird feeders, the independent variable is the variable that we as the scientists are changing and we are changing the feeder color. So if we're changing the feeder color, then what are we measuring? What's dependent on this change? Yes, and it's not necessarily a trick question, but we do have multiple options for a dependent variable. And this can be chosen by uh, your students and the level that they're at. Maybe they really want to focus on bird identification, and many of you are talking about the number and, and types of birds that are visiting the bird feeder. That can definitely be the dependent variable. 
For these fledgling ornithologists, they wanted to develop their measuring skills. So they specifically focus on the amount of seed eaten, which is wonderful. They, they don't need to focus on identifying birds or even being able to see all the birds that are visiting the feeders. Instead, they just regularly measure the amount of seed consumed to uh, understand which bird feeder is preferred. So when we look at this experiment, we're gonna break down will birds prefer blue, red, or yellow feeders? And we wanna make sure that all of our controls are in place so that we're only seeing the association between the amount of seed eaten and the color of bird feeder. Yeah, it's a really easy way to measure. Absolutely, Kirsten. And especially for those of you, I know we had a couple kindergarten teachers. This is absolutely perfect where you don't have to worry about your students identifying the birds. You can focus solely on counting the number of birds they see or just working on those measurement skills of measuring the amount of seed or cups of seed eaten, et cetera. Uh, let me just ask, are there any questions at all about what makes a fair experiment or independent, dependent, or control variables? Okay. So <clears throat> now that we have uh, gone through the fair experiments, I want to ask, have any of you ever experienced students who may have collected great data, they did a great experiment, but then completely struggled with creating a successful graph um, and can't clearly interpret the data, uh, that th the, the information that they collected? Oftentimes when we think of this, uh, we look at this as yes, especially with younger students, absolutely, Jennifer. That's what my thoughts are of, yeah, translating graphs into words, that's a tricky part. And so we tend to call this when bad graphs have gone wrong. They're not even good graphs, they're just bad graphs gone wrong. So I wanna show you a series of bad graphs that have been published by professionals around the country. And this is actually a great activity to do with students where they see these professional um, graphs or displays being made. And they are, the students then get to analyze, well, what is wrong? So our first one here is the Cooper Hawk population and it's soaring. And a quick glance at this looks like, yeah, the Cooper Hawk population really is drastically increasing from 1975 to 2013. But it's drastically increasing by 0.06%. And not so much of a drastic increase then, really. Or we can start asking, uh, what grade are your students in? And looking at a pie chart, you know, it's wonderful to see that 26% of freshmen it looks roughly about the same as 26% of seniors, which are both larger than 26% of sophomores and smaller than 26% of juniors, and that a pie chart totals 104%. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity where pie chart just simply went wrong. It doesn't even total 100%, and each ratio isn't represented the, the correct ratio, I guess. <laughs> Or we can talk about units of innovation. Wasn't really aware that innovation were units, but at least with this graph, they did attempt to put units on their graph, which is a good start. Though we need to start working on what are units of innovation. Kelly's just shaking her head next to me. I think she's quite embarrassed for some of these people. My personal, my polls, those are the last two and they're my personal favorites. The question of the day, what should cost less, a gallon of gas or a gallon of milk? milk? Well, no is the answer. Not really sure where that one came from. Or Scotland, uh, CNN released this poll, should Scotland be independent? 52% no, said no, 58% yes, the time when Scotland gave 110%. So even such a large, Groups like CNN make mistakes when it comes to displaying uh, data visualization. Yeah, 
wow is really um we have no words <laughs> we're just shaking our heads here but it's really fun to do this with your students and we got all these graphs from buzzfeed they have an article 13 graphs that are clearly lying so if you want a good laugh tonight i highly recommend reviewing those uh 13 graphs but now that we've seen that some graphs can really be bad what then makes a good graph when you're working with your youth on data visualization what do you ensure that they have in their graph to make sure it's a good graph and again share your thoughts in the chat window So looking back, labels, consistent units of information, appropriate scale. With young students, the pictographs or bar graphs, making sure it's readable, a, a table that's set up to answer their question and has a clear space for their variables. Absolutely. When we like to think of what makes a good graph, the first thing we always want to start with is identifying what types of graphs are there and what information does each type of graph represent? Ultimately, we would like our graphs to be worth a thousand words. It, in many times, graphs can be taken out of context, like those BuzzFeed articles, where you're just looking at the graph and you want viewers to be able to look at your graph and understand what was the question you were asking and what were the results. And you want it to be very clear so they have a full understanding without much background knowledge or context. So let's look at these four main types of graphs we have. A pie chart is when you're focusing on showing proportion. And again, unlike our grades of students where it adds up to 104%, true pie charts only add up to 100%. Not less, not more, 100%. Bar graphs are being used to compare two or more categories of things. And when you look at line graphs, they're going to be referred uh, to showing changes over time. They're best at representing trends in data. And that's very similar to scatter plots. It's a continuum of data. And so the, the line graphs and scatter plots are fairly similar. Um, it does tend to depend when you get more complicated of a continuum, which is going to be the line graph, versus the trends, which is going to be the scatter plot. But ultimately, the bar graph, the line graph, and the scatter plot, all of those do have a dependent variable that is measured and plotted on the y axis. That's going to be what's similar between those three. So I want to test your ability to identify a good graph from a bad graph. So I'm going to uh, show you guys six different graphs. We're going to spend about 15 to 20 seconds on each one. And if you guys, by chance, happen to have a scratch piece of paper beside you, um, that would be helpful. For each graph, I want you to just kind of remember, do you think it was a good graph or bad graph and why? So let's go through these six graphs. Here is our first one. I'm just going to spend a, about 15 seconds or so to give you some time to observe this graph and, and decide. So is this a good graph or a bad graph? We'll discuss um, whether you think it's a good graph or bad graph at the end of all six graphs. So moving on to our second one. Okay, moving on to our third graph. Move on to our fourth one.
Second to last graph, number five. Okay, and our last graph. So I want to start back at the beginning, our very first graph, and I want to chat with you guys. Did you think this was a good graph, a bad graph, or you're unsure? And provide some reasoning of, of why you think it's good, bad, or you're unsure. So Jennifer, right now you're saying not sure it's so busy. Mm -hmm. Your instinct, the fact that it's so busy, that right there is indicating this is a bad graph. It's unclear what the graph is communicating. It's too hard to compare info. It's not a good one because no label on the y-axis. You're uncertain what the numbers are labeling. Um, there's no title. It's just too much information. Exactly right, Tonya. This is a bad graph. It's a bad graph gone really, really wrong. Um, and personally, I know the kids probably love the colors, but that's the worst to me. The colors are just so distracting. So yes, just because you can do it does not mean you should. And with kids, you know, sometimes it's fun to create new graphs, especially if it's exciting, but having the uh, peer review process and critiquing, um, constructively critiquing graphs is important. So this is a bad graph. How about this one? What are your thoughts? Good graph, bad graph, unsure, and why? Good graph, it's nice and clear. You like that the colors are showing a trend. It's easy to read titles and interpret what the data is showing. It works for me. That's a good question, Jenna. Is the seed consumed cumulatively at each point? You thought it was good, a simple setup, a little unclear if this is showing total E and or by a day. That brings a really good question. Well, let's go to our, um, not that one, let's skip to this graph, because this is the same exact data. So when you look at this graph, do you think it's a good graph, bad graph, you're unsure? And what are your thoughts of this graph compared to the line graph? Much more clear, excellent. It's a good graph, very clear information. You like this better. Why do we like this one more? It is easier to see the blue is more popular. It's concise. It's easier to read. It, it split the info up. Absolutely, Kirsten. Um, you can see the blue is clearly more popular. So when we looked at our line graph, we're asking, okay, is the seed being eaten cumulatively over time? And when we talked about our basic, the types of graphs and what types of graphs are being used for, we look at the line graph. And the line graph is going to be something where you're looking at a continuum of data. But realistically, we wanna see the amount of seed taken from color feeders, and instead we wanna compare the colored feeders instead of seeing that continuum of seeding and comparing categories is what we utilize for bar charts so though we could use a line graph for this data ultimately a bar chart is a, a better type of graph to utilize because we're comparing the different categories so that's another wonderful 
strategy to utilize with students. Have the same data and make different types of graphs and then compare and contrast which graph better represents the data, which graph better represents the question we're trying to answer. So going to that graph we skipped, which raptor is your favorite? Is this a good graph, bad graph, or we're unsure, and why? Bad math. <laughs> More than 100%. <laughs> well, I'm at fault for this graph, though I will say it was intentional to create a bad graph. I had quite a lot of fun. It was very difficult for me to try and figure out a, a bad graph, and ultimately, Yes, owls are raptors, <laughs> and having, having that is a, yeah, it's just a bad graph. You know what I only just realized, because I got so hung up on the numbers, and the fact that owl is a type of raptor is how off the proportions are. Yes, too. the proportions are incredibly off. It didn't specify different raptors. It's just, it is one bad graph. So I'm going to take pride in the fact that I did create a horrible graph. Uh, on purpose. <laughs> our last two graphs, these are our last two, right? <laughs> um, this next one, does temperature affect the number of chickadees? What are your thoughts on this graph? We had a lot of great discussion with last night's webinar on this graph. So I'm curious what you guys are thinking. A good job. Oh, thank you. Good job on my bad graph. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. I appreciate the support. Yeah, Jennifer, absolutely. That mean number is just so close that we want to ask, you know, is it significant? You can't have half of a bird. That's very true point. <laughs> Not half of a living bird. Anyway. Not half of a living bird, yeah. Are there any other thoughts on this graph? Yes, the way the bar graph is set up, it does actually make it easy to see the comparison. Though we're not able to conclude much. I agree with that, Jaya. So when we talked about this graph last night, um, we had a lot of great discussions. It's a pretty small sample size. And we were left with a lot of questions. You know, what does the mean number of birds, how did they gather the mean number of birds? Um, simple things like having black cat versus chestnut sighted. Um, simple things like saying that it should technically be black capped chickadee and chestnut sided chickadee. Uh, simple things like that. But ultimately, we're looking and saying, you know, it's not a bad graph, but we're still left with some questions and there can be ways to improve it. Looking at that same data, though, we look at a graph like this. Now, what are your thoughts on this graph? You guys were asking a time frame would help. Well, this is your time frame. <laughs> That's a very good question, Renee. I don't know if you guys heard Kelly grumbling over here, but she said, oh, this hurts. Yeah. Kirsten, Kelly is doing the exact same thing. <laughs> You do like that it gives more sense of time, but we really don't know what's happening. So looking at this graph here, we run into the same exact issue as our very first graph. And this is actually the same exact data between our, this last graph, this graph, and our very first graph. We're looking at the same exact data, but it's represented three different ways. Now, the issue with this first graph and the last graph is that 
temperature and the number of birds are utilizing the same exact y-axis, which is why there's no label because it's doing double duty. And that's a big issue. Uh, with this bar graph representation, the bars are actually the days, which are quite confusing. And then we already discussed, we already discussed this first graph, really just, we need to throw it out. It's, it's really that bad. However, let's compare now our bar graph here with this line graph that we have. Now, clearly this second one really is uh, different, uh, to say the least. It is something, Jen, absolutely, Jenny, where you look at these two graphs side by side and you would never realize that it's the same data. So when we look at this bar graph, our temperature does, or our question, does temperature affect the number of chickadees? And this is probably, we should, we would want to uh, constructively critique the student saying, let's emphasize or detail this question a little more. Does temperature affect the number of chickadees observed, uh, the number of chickadees visiting a bird feeder, something along those lines? And we do specifically break out below five degrees Celsius versus above five degrees Celsius. And that's a lot clearer than looking at a line graph like this where we don't even know what the question is we're just trying to look at the relationship that is an option um, especially with older age groups i having them put up a temperature scale on the right side and the bird numbers on the left side could be a possibility um, but these are also we don't want to necessarily complicate the graph so being able to do that in a clear way is helpful um, and having that time is also very valuable. But when we look at here, because temperature is changing so much over time, then having that time range isn't necessarily needed because you're only comparing temperature. So though this graph may not be perfect, it is the best representation of all of our options of how to represent this data. Are there any questions on graphs or uh, bad graphs gone wrong or strategies that you've used to help with students uh, understanding data visualization and interpretation that you'd like to share. Thanks, Jenny. I actually just thought of that off the top of my head. So I'm quite happy that you like that idea of um, representing the same data in multiple ways. Yeah, so the investigating evidence curriculum, one of the lessons is completely dedicated to data visualization, where it breaks down what are those four types of graphs, what are the purposes of the four types of graphs, and going through students with students how to best choose the correct graph type for their data and how to visualize it. So that's absolutely included in the investigating evidence curriculum. So we're going to move on to our final topic here, all about sharing student work. So Jay, that's when it's a very good worry to have um, about. Okay, let me re say that then. Um, Jaya just made a comment. She's worried about using data and drawing conclusion when there are many factors that one is not taking into account that affects conclusions. So, as with all science, we are not proving that temperature does affect chickadee visits, for example. We're simply finding evidence that may support the statement. And what we're looking at with, with science, and all students should do this no matter the age group, is figuring out how does this data that I've collected um, impact my question I've asked? Does it support my statement? Um, does it reject my statement? Does it have no impact? 
And then what questions are we left to ask with? How can we go further to test out other potential variables? And again, this is where we go back into having a fair experiment. Kelly? Yeah, I would add just to what Lindsay was just saying that the experimental setup is gonna be crucial for alleviating your concerns about those factors, doing the best that you can to think about all of the things that you need to stay constant while recognizing the fact that any kind of research that you're doing in the natural world is gonna be subject to variables that you can't control. Um, but you can do your best to keep them constant and fair across your different treatments. Um, so spending a lot of time with that, creating that graph like Lindsay showed earlier, where you outline what those constants need to be and you really think very critically about how you can control for them to the best of your ability is going to be the best that you can do. It can never be perfect, no. unfortunately. And that's where with scientists, we often come up with um, repeating experiments and oftentimes making sure you do have sufficient data. So with our mean number of chickadee visits, that was really low numbers. It probably would have been a better uh, data visualization if we had more data to go off of, if there were more data points. Another great point that Scott brought up that asking these questions when you're looking back on your work is a really awesome reflective practice for mm -hmm. kids. It's a really great practice to be able to look at your data and interpret it and consider what else could have been going on. And when Lindsay showed that science process diagram earlier where everything was kind of feeding back on itself, this is another part of the loop where you can start identifying things, other things that you didn't control for that were going on, and you can go back and redesign the experiment and try again. So there's lots of opportunities here for continued learning, for critical thinking, um, just all sorts of really great opportunities to have some really authentic science learning happening. And ultimately, that question that you're having, you should be sharing that question with your students. Pose that question to them and have them think through this as well. That's really what we're trying to get at through this authentic scientific learning process. So we're going to finish with our final aspect of sharing student work, but I do encourage you, if you have more questions like that, please put them in the chat window. We'd be happy to address them. Um, once your students have finished analyzing their results, they're developing their conclusions, it's really important for them to recognize that their research does matter. It wasn't just for a grade, but in fact that they are scientists. And there are several ways to share student results. A fun way is to have students create a video, like this one here by Alyssa. And don't worry, there's no sound. Just a quick little... Can't get over that smile she has. So Alyssa did a full investigation on whether she could have birds have them become familiar enough with her that they ate out of her hand. So over a few weeks, she created a dummy Alyssa out of a hay bale and pumpkin as her head, dressed up in the same exact clothing with the gloves and all, and let the birds become accustomed to that pumpkin Alyssa and eat out of um, the gloves. And then she replaced that pumpkin and wanted to see if the birds would eat out of her hand, would recognize her. And she did this all for a science fair experiment. But looking at that reaction she had and the excitement of not just that a bird ate out of her hand, but it was a successful investigation. She proposed this hypothesis that the birds would recognize or that um, the birds wouldn't recognize it's different, would become accustomed to the pumpkin and she was successful with having the birds eat out of her hand. And so this is a wonderful opportunity to bring in um, video creations, uh, either video documenting your experiments or um, creating a final video sharing the results. Uh, any of those options, bringing in the technology component is a great incorporation. An incredibly, incredibly valuable skill for scientists is to take their research and translate it into terms that everyday people can understand, especially for the middle school and high school age group 
there are so many scientists that I've worked with throughout my college careers that uh, they could not explain their research clearly to me. And I, with the science background I had, I still couldn't understand their research. They just couldn't break it down into layman's terms. And this is practice and skill that students at the high school level should be developing. So challenge your students to write and publish articles either in their school newspaper or their local newspaper, but getting that science writing technique down where they can translate the science into everyday terms that the public can understand. So these guys here, this is the, um, the duck squad. They actually studied a mating nesting pair of ducks in their school courtyard and built a full duck pond for them. And so they developed their writing skills by outlining the entire process, the significance of their process, why they were doing it, the importance of it, and released that both in their school newspaper as well as uh, their local city newspaper as well. And then finally, we really want to encourage your students to become published scientists by having their work be published in Bird Sleuth's student publication magazine. Again, bringing the science, the complexity of the inquiry process full circle by scientists having published work. And we do that through the Bird Sleuth Investigator student publication magazine. This summer we'll be um, releasing our 20th edition of Bird Sleuth Investigator. But we've published investigations from how birds react to predators' calls. Would woodpeckers prefer oranges to suet in a suet feeder? What's the effect of temperature on hummingbird energy requirements? Uh, do, more, do we have more American robins outside than other birds? Um, can we compare mute swans and snow geese visit in Vermont? Or how do gray squirrel visits affect tufted titmice visits? These are all different investigations that students have done just in the last two years that have been published by our work. And the wonderful thing is how they've come up with such creative questions based on natural observations. For example, um, the effect of temperature on hummingbird energy requirements was done by an eighth grade student who loves hummingbirds, but was concerned of how global climate change may affect the hummingbirds that visit her bird feeder. So she wanted to see if we're going to have rise in, in global warming temperatures, how might that affect her lovely hummingbird? So she did a full investigation on it. And that's a type of making observations, asking questions, and designing the experiments that we want to reinforce. So we bring that full circle by publishing the student's work. And realistically, we want to have you guys have your students' work be published in our magazine. Whether it is full investigations like uh, the ones featured here, you could also have any form of creative writing, poetry, um, artwork. We love artwork. Uh, our cover image and back image are always student artwork submitted that year. So you are absolutely encouraged. We really want you to submit student work to us so we can have them become published scientists. This magazine is for students by students, and we need students' work to make it happen. So with that, again, if you want to continue going further, uh, investigating the evidence is the curriculum. We do recommend that as the basis for everything we've talked about today. But as far as professional development, to continue developing your skills around supporting inquiry and investigations in your educational setting, I do recommend the Integrating Inquiry for Educators online course. With that, Kelly and I will take any questions you do have. Uh, you may have. And one quick bit of housekeeping, um, actually two bits before I forget. For all of you guys attending this webinar, you will be able to receive actually a coupon for a free bag of bird seed thanks to our sponsors, D&D uh, &D or 3D and Wild Delight. They want to really support bird themed investigations in the classroom. And to do so, they're providing you guys with a free bag of bird seed. So you'll receive a follow-up email from Zoom, this webinar platform, uh, a day, one day after the webinar. And so probably tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening, by Saturday morning, you'll receive that coupon 
um, from 3D and wildlife bird seed. The other thing I do want to mention real quick is if you have, um, if you would like to receive a letter of completion for attending this webinar, please feel free to email us. The email is on the screen right now, birdsleuth at cornell.edu, and Kelly will also enter it in the chat window. Just send us an email. You want a letter of completion, she'll be happy to provide that with you to you. With that, we'll be, um, yeah, Diane, I do believe uh, the bird seed is only for the United States. I do apologize for that. Um, but we will be happy to electronically send you a letter of completion if you want. So we'll take any questions you guys may have, but thank you so much for joining us tonight. We had some great discussions. I really do appreciate it. Yes, this is all being recorded. The recording will be made available tomorrow morning. Um, Kelly, can you share the YouTube channel? Link? Uh, Kelly will share the YouTube channel, and that's where the recording for all of our archive webinars will be. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to mute myself if there are no questions. Kelly and I will hang out for a little bit, but we do hope you join us for any future webinars. And quick plug, I should have said this last night's webinar, the Great Backyard Bird Count, a wonderful global citizen science project, starts tomorrow. So if you want to get engaged with citizen science, I do recommend getting the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, so, Kirsten, the Birds and Investigator is an annual publication, so we don't have really a subscription, but you can purchase a printed version of that through our online store. Kirsten, am I correct in remembering that you're going to be joining us for the Citizen Science Investigator program? If so, just shoot me an email and, and we can talk about these Birds and Investigators there. Oh, the um, Smith Weaver. The Smith Weaver. Yeah. Gotcha. Perfect. Well, thank you guys very much. Like I said, Kelly and I will stay on to answer any more questions you have. Um, for the time being, I'll just mute myself and have a wonderful evening, everyone. <laughs>